this is the Academy of Nutritional Medicine's webinar with Professor Eva Shapi on the connection on the potential connection between Borrelia and breast cancer. We're delighted to have her here with us this evening. I'll just introduce her briefly. Um, Professor Shapi is an internationally recognized expert in Lyme disease research. She's on the front lines of searching for a cure for a disease that the CDC has said is the fastest growing vector-borne disease in the United States and possibly across the world. Her initial research focused on breast and ovarian cancer. She shifted her focus to finding better treatments for Lyme disease after contracting the disease herself. She did her postdoctoral training at Yale University's School of Medicine and received her PhD in genetics at Budapest University in Hungary. She was the first to discover the presence of Borrelia biofilm in infected human skin tissue, a finding that was published in the European Journal of Microbiology and Immunology, an international peer-reviewed online journal. And that represents one of her over 70 peer-reviewed scientific papers on Lyme disease. She has been recognized by Harvard Medical School for her Lyme disease research and was named a research trailblazer by Lyme disease org in 2018. She's shared her findings at conferences around the world and organized six Lyme disease symposiums at the University of New Haven, where she works which regularly draw over 200 participants and has received the Lyme Connection of Ridgefield's Courage Award. So without any further ado, ado um, Professor Sharpie, over to you. We will be um, collecting questions. Please put them in in the Q&A if possible, because we're able to save that. And we'll have at least 15 minutes at the end for those. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julian, and thanks everybody for joining us. Let me share the screen. Uh, so today I'm gonna uh, talk about uh, some new exciting research uh, on the potential connection of, uh, let me just uh, move this a little bit here. I'm just trying to move this down, okay. All right. Could you maybe make the whole screen? Um, Just one second, and you. here you are. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, thank you for the introduction, Julian. And I just want to tell just a few more things about our research group. Uh, we are from University of New Haven, uh, a small private university in Connecticut. And I'm working with graduate students I uh, uh, and a couple undergraduate students. I don't even have a technician. So all, all, the, uh, all the new studies are coming from this very, very excited and ready to go graduate students who are working with me in the last uh, over, over 15 years. Mm -hmm. So um, I always start with this slide. Uh, because I always want to remind everybody that we uh, discovered uh, Borrelia borderfri, the, the spirochete, which causes Lyme disease back in 1982. And since then, we're still struggling to understand how to get rid of this and how, how can we deal with uh, some uh, unexpected sim uh, syndromes even after treatment. Um, I want to show you something first, because I think that was the first uh, uh, video when it really uh, uh, help me to understand that we need to understand this uh, bacteria better. So this is this is just a YouTube video. As you see, Borrelia is a beautiful spirochete. If you ever worked with Borrelia, you know it's definitely something I always admire. Uh, those move beautiful spirochetal movements. And in this in this video, uh, they expose Borrelia to penicillin, uh, one of the antibiotics. And uh, if you're looking, looking at the video, so the penicillin is a uh, little bit but very, very, very soon, and something happens. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, yeah, we have it in slow motion. So here is, here is penicillin coming in. And yeah, it is, it is always some kind of bombs occurs, some kind of protrusion. 
and uh, something uh, called Navi clays called RAN bodies. So, <clears throat> what are those different morphological forms? What, ha what happened in this video? So, now obviously, or about 20 uh, years later, we start to understand that Borrelia it is not just a spiral heat. Uh, but it has other forms. What you just seen, it is called the round body forms. And this is just a, a culture from my lab. And as you see, just regular culture, when you culture Borrelia in a test tube, you see the spirohetal form, but you always see at least 10% of the culture always has these round body forms. And now we know these round body forms and spirohetal forms, they do have different antibiotic sensitivity. Of course, the last uh, 10 years, we start to understand that we have even other forms. One is for the persisters, which is uh, now we understand it is mainly floating biofilms. I'm going to talk about biofilms in a second. And we have something uh, extremely antibiotic resistant, which I'm going to talk more about it called the biofilm form. I wanted to show you this slide. It's back in 2011 when we looking at these different forms. And my first question uh, was, do these different forms have different antibiotic sensitivity? And I know that's a complicated uh, uh, slide. This is from the paper. Uh, but all data very clearly showed that uh, the biofilm form and those persistent forms has very much higher antibiotic resistance than the spirohetal forms. Just again, back in 2011, this is called the live and dead staining. The red stain is dead, the green stain is, is, is alive. And as you see, uh, uh, this, um, this aggregates, you see the control, this aggregate is treated with all kinds of different antibiotics. And as you see, some of them work better than others, but regardless, after uh, even after a week of treatment, you, you still are seeing a lot of uh, green, which means viable cells. Um, so I'll keep talking about biofilm. So let's just introduce a little bit more. So what is biofilm? Usually biofilm is a collection of uh, microorganisms. So it could be bacteria, but it could be yeast or even protozoa. And usually you find biofilm on, on surfaces. However, uh, Dr. Lee Costerton told me that uh, also floating biofilms are not uncommon. So I'll give you some example. For example, a plaque that forms on, on, on your teeth or the slime forms on the surface of the, of the shower. The one we try, we try to clean it, you know, every week. So, um, and that's very important because those, uh, those slime actually is a slimy secretion, which is a mucoid polysaccharide, which is practically protecting this uh, biofilm. And when I talked to Dr. Costerton, uh, uh, um, he told me that he believes that most of the bacteria, well, at least 90% can uh, live in biofilm form. However, at this point, we still have only a handful of bacteria. We, we have proven that can form biofilm form. So, so why it is a problem? Uh, uh, first of all, uh, just even in, in industry, it can damage the industrial equipment. Uh, uh, it can contaminate food. Definitely energy lost uh, in some energy transfer as those Navy ships, uh, they have huge problem with the biofilms. Uh, but for us, the most important thing is they, they are super resistant to antibiotics. How, how much? Uh, the estimated it could be at, at least thousand fold more resistant than, than, than the planktonic form. So um, let's go back to 2012. I just realized it was 10 years ago. So this is when we, we wanted to understand a little bit more Borrelia biofilm, and we hypothesized that those, those uh, aggregates we're seeing, and I, I showed you before, they are really biofilm. We use different methods, but I think the most convincing was uh, something called atomic force microscopy, which is a microscopy method which you can see live uh, uh, biofilms. So we can, we can actually monitor the development. On the left side, you see you see uh, spiral heats, we started to form uh, some kind of aggregates. You see just sort of lining, lining, uh, lining up nicely. When you wait for, uh, so it was two days, four days later, you see it lining up in a very uh, organized way. Let's, sit, uh, let's wait two more days, as you see, there's definitely some structure 
around this uh, biofilm. And this is a 12, this is my favorite one because it looks like a crochet. Uh, you can see there's definitely logic in the madness. So Borelli knows what he's doing. And, and after, if you're looking at some late biofilms, you see, uh, you can see there's something forming here. You can see on the right side a little bit better. So this is a surface of a biofilm. You can see the spiral hits here. And there are channels because think about it. I remember I mentioned that there's a slime layer on the biofilm that's protecting the biofilm, which is great. Uh, it's protected from antimicrobial agent or, or from immune system, but it still needs to have nutrition and uh, the waste still needs to be expelled. So as you see, uh, uh, it creates those channels, which we create in when we build the city, yes? The same, same idea. We, we can protect ourselves, but at the same time, we need to know how to bring in nutrition and how to uh, eliminate waste. This is actually a very, very, very good picture. You could see, you could see it, a channel in a very, very high magnification. So this is back, again back in 2012, uh, we had to have some more evidence whether what we're seeing is a true biofilm. We find at the one of the those those slimy layer is actually alginate. So we provide evidence in this paper that is alginate. And uh, and uh, the next question was in right after we published this paper, is it in just in a test tube? I got so many emails you could imagine, and they they did not necessarily were, were complimentary. Let's put it this way. They just said that what I'm seeing is only happens in the test tube. Is not is no way that it, it, I gonna find any biofilm in um, in some biofilm sorry Borelli infected tissues. So we, we were up for a challenge. Uh, so this is 2013, 2014. And, and I know first that I need to find some, some, some clinical samples, which, which we know that we should be able to find biofilm. And uh, again, Europe came to res rescue. I got samples from Austria, uh, Dr. Zager, who sent me skin biopsy samples from Borel infected skin lesion. These samples were already proven as Borrelia, have Borrelia. So uh, that, was, that was a very, uh, very uh, important uh, help for us at this point. And um, just a little bit later, I also got some autopsy tissues from a very well-documented Lyme disease patient uh, from Dr. Ligner and Dr. Coleman from Colombia, which was, again, was, was super important to to uh, prove the concept that biofilm indeed uh, exists in vivo in the body, not just not just in a test tube. So it took us a lot of time. So 2015, we were able to um, um, publish this paper. This is, was the uh, proof of concept that uh, biofilm indeed exists in in some infected tissues. Let me just show you just a few. Uh, so I always show this one because that slide, because that was the very, very first one. So we got the tissue and we stained, stained the tissue for Borrelia and we wanted to see what kind of form we will see. So you see here, there are definitely spirohetal forms. That, that, was, that was good. You know that uh, in this tissue, we should, have, we should see spirohet. And on this left bottom, you see that shows up and it stains with the biofilm marker. So that was, that, was, that, was, that, was a, that was a good moment in the lab. And of course, uh, we did all kind of other staining, the classical silver staining, just again, prove that what we're seeing is indeed Borrelia in the biofilm form. This is just a couple more images from that paper. Um, um, so that, that, was, that was very important that Finally, we were able to provide evidence that this biofilm indeed can be found in infected tissue. Uh, that was also one of the one of the very important uh, uh, figure because we used this atomic force microscopy. I just showed you some images, and the question was: uh, in these tissues, can we see those channels I showed you before? And indeed, if you look at this, at this part of the tissue, this is the biofilm, this is the part of the um, um, tissue which we find this biofilm uh, Borrelia with the alginate marker, and you can very clearly see those, those channels. So that's again was, was very, very important for us. So um, I didn't really mention when I introduced biofilm that biofilm very rarely monospecies, meaning 
very rarely just one bacteria. So of course, uh, when we find this, the first question was, can we find something, something else in this biofilm or just Borrelia? So for that, when I got lucky, because uh, my husband actually uh, is a bioinformatician, and he said, I can, I can help you to find it uh, by just using a computer. And I, of course, I was a little bit hesitant at this point because how you can do it. But at this point, uh, he was doing some uh, very interesting work uh, um, in, in, in his job, Perkin Elmer. And what they did, they took these infected skin tissues and uh, they sequenced everything what is in it. And he said, I can, I can take out the human part and I can analyze what, what left. So if you have Borelli in it, I try to find it, but I can also try to find some, uh, if anything else shows up, some, any, any other important uh, pathogens. So after, after all this uh, computer work, bioinformatic work, he did find Borrelia borderferi, which we were of course very happy because that's, uh, as a confirmation, but he also found lots of lots of these something called chlamydia species. And um, in the paper, you can read more about it, you know, why chlamydia. Uh, at this point, I remember I heard uh, some actually some European talks that they find a lot of chlamydia in, in, in ticks, also next to Borrelia. So we found very surprised, but we want to know where, where is this chlamydia? Is it is it in the biofilm or somewhere else in the tissue? So for that one, we used a different kind of uh, microscopy method called the confocal microscope, which can see the tissue in, in a 3D uh, representation. So here, so we find Borrelia and the chlamydia was actually overlapping, which is of course on the review, I would always say, oh, maybe it's just somehow the channel is overlapping. So we had to really use this confocal microscope and look inside the biofilm exactly where this signal coming from. And if you look at here, so think about, so we're looking inside from, from, from the side to look at the biofilm and see the chlamydia, which is red, right inside of the biofilm. So that's a spatial distribution, which we find very interesting. Alginate in the case is blue is outside, which makes sense because that should be a surface. So there is a lot of, of course, a lot of um, speculation why chlamydia is inside, but always when we, when we see uh, a structure when it has multiple pathogens, you always think about symbiosis, so they help each other. And one thing we find very interesting that Borrelia cannot use iron. It's very well known for Borrelia. However, biofilms actually protected by iron. So we were speculating at this point chlamydia can use, uh, can use iron, might be helping this to make this biofilm even stronger. That again, just a speculation, we don't have proof for that. Uh, now, with using a very si a similar method uh, with another dermatological speci specimens, uh, we also find Borrelia. But in this case, we find Helicobacter uh, pylori, which you probably say, hey, that should be in a stomach. Actually, uh, I, I, we done a lot of obviously digging the literature where helicobacter can show up and actually can show up almost in every single organ. In that case, uh, we find it again mixed uh, biofilm with Borrelia. Uh, uh, you see it, this is again patient samples and uh, the question again was the same question whether uh, are they on the same biofilm or they are separate. So. We did a lot of uh, lot of immunohistochemistry inside the hybridization is a method to visualize it, and not just if that we found them in the same structure, but we also, which is, was super interesting, we found with uh, sorry, sorry about that, we found it in some amyloid changes. Now, uh, I'm gonna come back obviously to this amyloid changing because amyloid changes you think about Alzheimer. But uh, now we know actually back in uh, Dr. Miklos, back in the 1990s, uh, she, she published a paper that those amyloid changes is not just happening in brain uh, tissues, but it can happen in any tissue. So, so in, in that case, it looks like it happened in, in uh, skin tissue. So uh, thioflavin staining, amyloid staining, this is, this is just markers for amyloid, amyloid genesis. Uh, Actually, we were very happy because one of our antibody uh, panels see here did not work. 
uh, we purchased two amyloid antibody and all, uh, one worked, which is shows which actually we liked it because it shows that you know not everybody st everything staining or samples, but also showed it it might have some differences what uh, amyloid changes um, in the brain and in the tissue in the skin tissues. Uh, of course, when you look at amyloidogenesis, you have to look at phosphatau, and again, we, we see phosphatau presence in the skin tissue. So that also was very, very interesting um, to see that a different, a different uh, clinical specimen, and you have uh, different, uh, different uh, uh, symbiotic relationship bet uh, between different uh, pathogens. Or oh, this is one more, uh, one more uh, uh, picture. So this is we also did. Uh, uh, confocal microscopy for, for the, those skin tissues. And again, we see very interesting spatial distribution of those two species. And just, I put it back the chlamydia picture so you can see that uh, confocal microscopy can help us to understand how they coexist. All right, so, so we find it in the skin. Uh, where else can we find uh, Borrelia biofilm? Obviously, if you look at, uh, this was from a 2014 review, they find a, a biofilm from other species in a lot of different organs. So that was, the, um, that was again, back in 2016, we were lucky enough, again, European uh, specimen, uh, we got some um, some uh, very good specimen from a very well documented uh, patient who had not just Lyme disease but also had Alzheimer disease, and uh, uh, we were able to get uh, some hippocampus uh, samples. And of course, we did the same thing. Uh, we we um, we stained them for Borrelia, uh, and we did find spirohydrophones, but mainly actually. Uh, mainly if we find biofilm forms, and those biofilm forms are coexisted with uh, amyloid markers. So that was, that was very similar, similar uh, um, observation than uh, what we've seen uh, in that skin, other skin tissues. And we had some other uh, histological staining, that's Dr. McDonald, beautiful staining, and you can really, really see that beautiful spirochetal structure here. And of course, we did some uh, inside to hybridization um, method also to further prove it. And uh, also we did uh, some phosphatal staining. And again, it was very similar findings what we found um, uh, in the skin tissues. This paper published uh, just this January in the Journal of Alzheimer's Research. And um, one of the biggest uh, uh, project we done, uh, supported actually with the Global Alliance at this point, uh, we got this autopsy tissues I mentioned before from Columbia University, from Dr. Goldman. Uh, Dr. Ligner was the, 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 the leading doctor on this, uh, on this case. And this woman uh, was, was the first uh, uh, reported Lyme disease patient who did not respond to therapy. Uh, uh, she had 16 years history of Lyme disease. She was on and off of, uh, on antibiotics. Um, I had chance to talk to Dr. Ligner numerous times, and um, I, I gained uh, I gained appreciation. You know how much how much uh, antibiotics help this person, and uh, if anybody knows this case, they know that unfortunately, um, when uh, the insurance ran out and she wasn't able to get more antibiotics, she died uh, uh, with multiple complications. So the silver lining of this case was that. Um, uh, the autopsy tissue were saved and sent to Columbia University. So after all this, uh, I just show you that the project we we uh, were able to convince Global Life Alliance that uh, let's let's really look at these tissues uh, 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 in very um, uh, very uh, comprehensive way and see what happened here. Uh, as I mentioned, this was that was that 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 case was very well. Uh, 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 very well studied. This is the this is back in 1992. This this is an abstract uh, uh, when the uh, the report of the Lichner reports that it, she doesn't respond to antibiotics. So uh, this is actually not uh, this is uh, not a published paper, but this was the very first uh, one of the very first slides we got from uh, Doctor. Uh, Goldman, that's actually liver. And when, when uh, we stain the liver with different antibody, she asked me to use uh, 
we call the polyclonal monoclonal antibody to see what we're seeing. Of course, we use the biofilm markers. Uh, we couldn't, we, could, we couldn't believe what we see here. It was, it was the biggest biofilm we ever seen in any of the tissue we studied at this point. So, uh, of course, uh, at, uh, he sent us uh, slides uh, from other, other organs like heart, kidney, liver, and, 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 and brain. And as you see, uh, we, we, we saw um, uh, lots of lots of spiral heat, but a lot of, lot of biofilm also showed up in different organs. Uh, this is just a quantitative analyze how many biofilm we find. Uh, uh, number of, it's a number of slides, and as you see, uh, most either uh, zero to six uh, biofilm could be found in one slide, and you see that usually on that 20 to 30 micrometer um, um, size. Uh, in this paper, we only published uh, the CD3 result. What is CD3? This is a marker for infiltrating um, um, lymphocytes, obviously a marker for inflammation. And uh, we have some other data. I think we, I might have a slide for it. Um, so what, what, what we did here for presentation, so we made actually uh, uh, this picture is low magnification, so you could see what's happening around the tissue. And it's used to be a brain, heart, kidney, and liver. I think maybe the liver is liver and kidney is, is very traumatic. So you see the very, it is the biofilm, small biofilm, but look at the brown staining is the is the CD3 positive lymphocytes surrounding the biofilm and same for the liver. You see, his, that, that's actually the big, the big liver I showed you before. But if you look at the slide, right there in the middle of the biofilm is, is surrounded by the CD3 lymphocytes. So it's definitely an uh, inflammatory response happened here. Uh, we had, in this paper, we had one of the uh, confocal against three-dimensional uh, uh, representation of the C. Very nice, uh, beautiful. Okay. When I say beautiful, you understand it's coming from a, uh, from a scientist view because then obviously it's not up to some, uh, samples, um, but very uh, large amount of spiral heat. And we had uh, um, right here a biofilm. How do I know? Because the blue is the alginate, the biofilm marker. That data is not published and needs to be repeated. So this is uh, different markers, different inflammatory markers from different uh, different organs, and as you see, uh, for example, a heart, we had the CRP, the C-reactive protein was, was very, very high. Uh, kidney, CD3, uh, and MMP9, which is a, MMP9 is a, a metalloproteinase, which is very important in tissue degradation and remodeling. So it was very interesting that um, um, a different organ had different, uh, uh, different markers. We're still working on this one. Um, at this point, uh, we're really, really interested in uh, host and uh, pathogen interaction. And uh, with my colleague, uh, we looked at some uh, neuron cells, how they respond to Borrelia. But in this case, we actually, we didn't just give Borrelia, but Borrelia excrete these little vesicles, these membrane vesicles. And we were always very fascinated by that. Whether just secreting these little vesicles is enough to create uh, some kind of response. And in this paper, it's published 2010, um, we indeed show that these uh, vesicles can, um, can uh, counter superoxide production of these neurons. It's almost like, uh, Make, make the environment ready for Borrelia. It was a super in, interesting paper. Let me, uh, let me show you, I think I have a, yeah. So, um, so, so uh, in this one, uh, again, two different approach. One, we infected uh, the neuron cells with uh, Borrelia. You, you see, this is the confocal microscope image of this infection. And we also use the vesicles. So just because it's so beautiful, I, I, I bought this one. So this is, uh, this is a little, so you see how Borrelia can infect this neuron. So you can see this inside of the neuron cells one of the best video we, we have, if you go. Okay, so, so as you see, we interested finding what are different tissues and uh, I, um, 
Julia mentioned my background, and uh, you know, I'm uh, at Yale University. Actually, I did study ovarian and breast cancer research, and I. And the last, obviously, having this kind of training and after uh, training in infectious diseases, I've seen so many parallels uh, that was striking. Actually, I even wrote a little commentary a couple of years ago, but how striking uh, the similarity between, you know, um, a, a tumor, genetic, uh, tumor genesis and, a, and an infectious uh, process. So uh, that was one. Uh, uh, inspiration, but other inspiration that I I was getting these emails from women who who got breast cancer right after a Lyme disease uh, diagnosis. So that just made me think that why don't we look why don't we look uh, Borrelia in in cancer? So uh, it's, you know uh, the stars aligned, and actually. Uh, uh, we had a visitor at this point, um, Sam Sorbello, who, who actually was looking for um, uh, initiate cancer research at the University of New Haven, and he found me, and we did this the pilot study. Um, we we actually just bought the breast cancer slides, uh, commercially available. So we bought bought the slides, and and the question was, uh, can we find Borel in it? And it. Even we were surprised because very significant of numbers of invasive breast doctor carcinoma and, and even lower invasive breast carcinoma are positive the presence of Borrelia. Now this study is not published. Uh, we're working on it. Um, the last again it was COVID, so so practically we just really came back like half year ago to the to lab fully. So we purchased more slides and right now we're in a process to staining those with different antibodies. Uh, finally, we got back to our comfort call microscopy uh, uh, unit. It, 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 it's from Yale. They have a beautiful uh, uh, microscopes there. So we just practically started this project and we want to see a little bit more about what exactly happening here. And, uh, but in the meantime, uh, we, because remember, we infected some, some neuron cells. Uh, we, we wanted to know whether it can be, in fact, breast cancer cells. Now, breast cancer cells are epithelial cells. Epithelial cells are designed to, to protect us from bacteria. So, so it wasn't the obvious project whether really we can infect those cancer cells or not. But we took the challenge. And uh, uh, we took um, a breast cancer cell lines, a triple negative, 231. And actually, we started to, it was very surprised very early. And I'll give you some, some time point here, just one second. We started to see actual evidence that Borrelia can even, even not just attached to epithelial cells, which was actually published before, but it can enter epithelial cells. I mean, this, this is. Uh, Again, a confocal microscopy. Now you can look into, into these cells and you see, um, I think it was after 48 hours, you could see Borelli inside the cells. Okay, and I, I have a video I, which is not as good as the previous one, but hopefully you can maybe still see it a little bit fast. All right, so, all right, so, so that was interesting. Uh, so we started to look into what do we know about, you know, cancer and infectious agents, especially bacterial agents. I mean, everybody knows H. pylori can cause gastric cancer now, but, you know, it's a couple more list. Uh, yes, chlamydia showed up in lung cancer. Um, mycoplasma, uh, chlamydia, ovarian cancer. So we, we de definitely have uh, evidence that uh, bacteria also can cause cancer. Um, if you look at uh, breast cancer, Staphylococcus e. coli and some Bartonella species are already suggested it might be prevalent. So um, I mentioned uh, to the organizers that, that, that uh, I just finished my, my teaching a couple of weeks ago. So uh, finally, I can really spend a lot of time to look at, uh, uh, look at the literature and really read those, those very important paper, papers. And this is one of the papers, for example, uh, I found um, from Cell, which is shows that 
that uh, this microbiota, the bacteria uh, inside those lung cancer tissue can really help uh, to this uh, tissue to survive, not just survive, but even, even um, uh, spread. Uh, no, but uh, how about breast cancer? Now, let me show you these 2018 studies. Uh, uh, the, the goal was the study to look at what kind of signature, pathogenic signature breast cancer could have. So uh, I'm not gonna go uh, deep in the study, but as you see, they find Borrelia, they find Chlamydia, they find Helicobacter, and even Treponema which was interesting that Borel, the spirochid bacteria, which is Borrelia and Treponema syphilis, yeah, is associated with uh, different types of breast cancer and, and with poor prognosis. So that, that was, that was, that was eye-opening. Again, this was, there was a huge study that also looked at uh, yeast and some other uh, viruses and other, other pathogens. That's again a 2019 study uh, when they looked at again these uh, bacterial signatures in the breast cancer from different uh, ethnic groups. And this is one of the uh, figures, and I was analyzing this figure. And as you see, let's look at the right. Uh, you see, so the, this is a tumor samples. This is the normal pairing, yes. And this is the normal samples. And if you look at, so, so red is over. Uh, not overexpressed, but a uh, large amount of uh, uh, organism. I guess the blue is, is less. So as you see, spider heat actually shows up very strongly uh, with, in a tumor, while, while it is not as, as, as present in, in normal. I find it extremely interesting. And just this April, we have another paper, which is uh, it's a long paper. So you really have to dedicate like a couple of days to, to really read and really because there's a ton of information inside in this paper. And uh, this is about how a bacteria, a bacteria, bacteria, certain bacteria can help the cancer spread. And what they tried to do is um, uh, when they analyzed uh, how it, it really happens, they find that you know, when, when, the, when the cancer cells enters the bloodstream, so there's a bloodstream here, they have to sort of uh, withhold this mechanical stress and the bacteria helping them. This is totally fascinating to, uh, and why the bacteria would help them? I mean, they they want the right, yes. They they hijack the cells and let's. I mean, bacteria always want to spread. And I know that it will be questions about so should we treat uh, cancer, breast cancer with uh, with antibiotics? And actually, they did. These uh, investigators they try different antibiotic cocktails. Guess what? They also tried doxycycline, and. Um, Doxycycline and the other antibiotic treatment actually reduced the tumor metastasis more than threefold. So that was that is definitely a very very important paper, and opens up uh, you know a lot of lot of questions and potential potential um, research projects. However, so I mentioned 2022 paper. I let me show you a paper from 1907. So that's that's an oldie but goodie when they also uh, looked at spiral heats in cancer in mice. So check it out, uh, uh, as, uh, um, you can find it online. All right, so here's our hypothesis right now with, with this project. Uh, we think that maybe Borrelia might play a role in tumorgenic changes in breast epithelial cells. And uh, our latest paper from, from last year, uh, we infected, uh, uh, different type of breast cancer cells and normal cells with Borrelia. And we looked at how they, how they behave. One thing uh, we found that they don't grow faster, so it didn't affect uh, the proliferation, which is of course very important for uh, cancer. But what we've seen is a technique when it shows whether it affects the invasion. So this is, this is in a test tube, it's not in, in tissues. 
And on the top panel, you see a normal uh, mammary epithelial cells, because MCF10 is a typical cell line they use for, uh, for this kind of research. And the uh, bottom, you see a triple negative breast cancer cells. And as you see, it is um, a very large, uh, very large increase in invasion, at least in a test tube. I know it will be questions, did you check other cell lines? Yes, we did. Actually, we're still checking them. And it's very interesting data. Uh, some of the hormone sensitive, the increase in invasion is not as obvious. So we, need, we still need to go back and, and see whether uh, we can get some significant increase. As, as, uh, even for some other triple negative cell lines still, uh, still need to establish whether we see this kind of very, very dramatic increase. Um, on the same paper, uh, we also looked at uh, tumor markers, uh, especially which is in, uh, correlated with in invasiveness, something they call the epithelial mesenchymal um, uh, transition markers. These very important markers for invasiveness. So we did uh, a whole study and look at it. And we, 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 we've seen a lot of changes, um, but the, when we did the statistical analysis, actually uh, uh, one of the most important changes was, remember MMP9? I mentioned MMP9 in, in the, in the, in the, in the, the autopsy cases. MMP9, which is a metal, metal protease, showed up very, very significantly. So we continue this right now, this um, uh, project uh, with a little bit different approach. So what, what, what we're doing right now, and again, I hope I can bring this data very, very soon. Uh, so um, when we looked at these markers and we see such a big, big uh, changes, we decided to look for not just those markers, but whatever markers we can find, something called the RNA seq analysis, which is RNA sequencing, which is, means that we sequence every transcript uh, uh, transcribe in this in this um, in the cell lines in these tumor cell lines, and uh, we just got back those those reads and we analyzing it and it's super interesting. Again, hopefully, I can present it soon. Uh, some of my students are very interested uh, in this uh, new class of RNA uh, molecules called microRNA, which is getting a lot of lot of attention recently because they looks like they are they can regulate um, a large amount of uh, markers. So uh, for that reason, uh, a lot of people are now suggesting that maybe instead of going out to certain markers, we, we find some important microRNA and just target those. So we just finished our first uh, study on this one. And it, again, very interesting result. Um, it was just a couple of days ago that the student just defended the thesis. Um, we're hoping that we can, we can send out this data very soon. Of course, we've been very interested in tissue remodeling factors, um, um, especially uh, you see the MMP9 result was very strong. So we actually extending the study and look at other tissue uh, remodeling factors. And one thing is, is uh, especially reading these new uh, papers, how, how is you know, uh, bacteria not just uh, able to help them to spread the breast cancer cells, but that also can give them some chemotherapy resistance. So we have, we have a, a study to, to look at those resistance and hopefully it will be also can be published soon. So you can see what else you're doing in the lab. I mean, I did not mention too much about or anti, antimicrobial studies that, that would, would take another, other uh, lecture. And I am sure that you see in the papers that we, we done, we done a lot of lot of studies, not just from antibiotics, but uh, but some herbal agents and some other alternative agents. Uh, you might heard about that. We found the stevia, yes, used uh, sweetener, had amazing effect on those biofilms. So so those studies are right now uh, continuous. The latest one we try to uh, I, we we have uh, um, some new hires in our department, and we have a virologist. So 
you might heard about phage therapy. So she promised me that maybe we can look, look for some, some phage, some virus which can attack the Borrelia. So those studies are still uh, going. The other, other one is, um, um, you see there's a lot of um, test tube in vitro studies. And, and when you're looking at especially biofilm, biofilm is a tissue. So we really have to, uh, have to find some other ways to study um, uh, this uh, biofilm resistance uh, to antibiotics. So uh, in 2019, we published a study when we took some skin biopsies, some leftover skin biopsies uh, from Yale, from mouse skin biopsies, and we practically injected Borrelia and see if they form biofilm in the skin uh, biopsies, and they did. And uh, so this is, this is again, we call the ex vivo culture system. So we still want to see if we can use it for, for really studying on, on type by, on type microbial resistance uh, for Borrelia. And the latest one is our zebrafish model. Uh, again, we are a small university, so we don't have any more housing except just uh, about four or five years ago, we actually established a zebrafish facility. And of course, my first question was, can we use zebrafish as an animal mod model for Borrelia infection and can we study that? This is my dream. So um, this is zebrafish embryo. So you see, you see this 96 fat plate. And uh, in a 96 fat plate, you put a couple embryos, you infect them with Borrelia. And after you can do all kind of uh, what kind of antimicrobial studies right in an animal. Just want to remind you, zebrafish is, has in it an adaptive immune system, very similar to us. Of course, we have a lot of homologs genes. So, so we believe that would be a, a good model. And uh, we just finished the first phase and we just sent our first paper for uh, review. It's under review right now when we showed that Borrelia indeed can sur uh, survive with zebrafish. So we, it might be potential to use uh, a zebrafish as a, as a model for antimicrobial, uh, finding some new antimicrobial agent for, for Borrelia and maybe some other, other bacteria also, of course. So here's my summary. Um, uh, one of our major findings that Borrelia does have an anti, very uh, antibiotic resistant form called biofilm, uh, which we proved that it can uh, be found in human infected tissue. Um, biofilm forms provide very effective refuse strategy from antimicrobial treatments. Again, I haven't uh, presented most of the data, but they all published very easily fine. Um, and what we find, what we find so, so fine, Borrelia can infect various tissues and cells and can make changes in the whole cell's physiology. And this is, this is, uh, this is where we continue you know, our cancer uh, project. Borrelia can, can enhance cell invasion and looks like Borrelia can be found in breast cancer tissues in a very significant amount. And here is my, here is my, uh, here is my group. Uh, so this is graduate student who stays with me usually for two years. I've, I'm so I'm, I'm I'm just looking at the faces. We just uh, uh, this is Miranda who does the microarray uh, uh, studies, and unfortunately she just graduated. She just defended. This is but I still have still have some other amazing students. And of course, I would like to uh, special thanks first of all University of New Haven. These studies cannot be done. I believe anywhere else because I had so much support. College of Arts and Sciences, for example, I mentioned Zebrafish, they, they build the whole Zebrafish facility. And of course, all those private foundations in the list who, who helped us all the way, uh, smaller, bigger donation, that was very, very important to continue our research. Um, like now, a Pink Clover Foundation and Philanthropic Trust is supporting our breast cancer research initiative. And we have very strong uh, microscope, um, uh, which we are extremely proud of. And this is this is the organization who actually su uh, supported the, the purchase of those microscopes. And I know we have we're gonna have uh, some questions, but um, somehow we don't have time to uh, answer your question. Here is my email. Just shoot me an email, and I try to answer your question even after this talk. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Professor Sharpie. Absolutely fascinating and, and really, really leading edge. Tremendous. Um, we've got a lot of questions here, so I'll start with one from um, Dr. Schwarzbach from Germany, who I, I know you know and have worked with. He says, um, we can test for round bodies with Tickplex antibody tests from blood. How can we test for biofilms? Can we try dark field microscopy in blood or just um, can we only use tissue biopsies with cultures? That's, I, I know it's this question gonna come. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you want to see the biofilm. Uh, and yes, we could try uh, um, dark field microscopy. And I know some, some investigators tried and, and uh, they, they had some result. Uh, right now, it, there is an initiative at Yale to uh, one of my uh, ex uh, Yale colleague really want to see biofilm. So he's he's got he's 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 a radiologist. So he's working very hard to figure out how can we see biofilm inside the body. That will be fascinating. I hope he's successful. Thank you. And just a follow up question from um, the same doctor. Do you have any evidence of Bartonella in breast cancer in your study? Um, he has found several papers concerning that. Yes, so uh, there are, there are uh, we, we, we don't study Bartonella in our lab. Very simple reason. Borrelia is a very slow growing bacteria. I don't want to bring in any other bacteria into our lab, but, uh, but I'm pretty sure everybody knows that uh, there, are, there are a lot of uh, promising studies, uh, unfortunately, uh, um, uh, a late doctor who who uh, who had evidence Bartman also uh, also can be present in um, in breast cancer. If you look at the 2018 study studies, they did find Bartonella in breast cancer. So again, um, I always believe that we shouldn't look at just one bacteria. We all, they always together. So one, even this biofilm, I show you evidence that there are multiple bacteria can be present and who knows how many more. So we're still digging uh, to understand how they work together, how, to, how, to, how they communicate and how to help each other and how they live in symbiotic, symbiotic relationship to do what they do. Make sense? Right, thank you. One participant um, wonders whether her hairy cell leukemia could have been caused by Borrelia. And as an add-on question there, she asks whether um, there's any evidence of um, how cannabis affects biofilms, if there are any studies. Actually, um, um, the hair cell of uh, again, absolutely. Uh, now I'm seeing, you know, uh, I didn't even present it. We look, obviously when we purchase those breast cancer cells, guess what, we purchased some other cancer slides. So I didn't mention because that was an, even a smaller study definitely needs to be uh, uh, repeated. So, so I do believe that is a strong connection between Borrelia and cancer. Um, cannabis, uh, actually we did have a study, uh, one of the anti micro study. We, we had a poster presentation. Uh, we wanted to repeat the study so many times, but every time we, um, uh, we purchase a different, uh, different uh, get some cannabis from different source, it's somehow the, the data always looks a little bit different. So, um, I know I have a student who really wants to go back and, and repeat those data. So hopefully we can publish those data. Fascinating, thank you. And um, another participant just wondered, because you mentioned stevia so fleetingly at the end, whether it was actually proven beneficial in studies or the opposite. Could you just elaborate on that a little bit? More? Um, oh. So our studies was obviously a test tube study, uh, uh, and I didn't. I'm sorry, I didn't have time to present it. Uh, the paper is published. Just simple Google search, you can find the paper is free online. Um, what we find is very fascinating when we looked at the biofilm of the stevia treatment. That was one of the most effect we have seen on biofilm with, with anything we ever studied. Uh, even when we when we uh, when we uh, compared it to doxycycline or the doctor mycin combo what, what was published by Dr. Zhang lab, very much better effect. The only thing we've seen a strong effect like that was the B venom, but it is a venom. So, so uh, again, I, I got a lot of questions about B venoms, but, uh, and I'm not, obviously, I know that some people use it for therapy. I'm still cautious about a little bit about that. Now, Saying that, so what happened in the clinic, uh, Dr. Horowitz had some clinical trials, probably you guys heard about it, 
and he found beneficial uh, stevia with some other alternative uh, agent in his patients. Thank you. Various therapists are mentioning that they suspect that the hydro alcoholic tincture of stevia is the correct form to take and not the white granules that you would use to yeah. sweeten your it's in tea, tea or whatever. Correct. That's it. That's correct. It's interesting. We, we of course, uh, when we find stevia again, we just purchased in the, in the, in the store. Um, I asked the group to find every every comp, every uh, whatever you can find for stevia from different manufacturers to to figure out what 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 could be the uh, the active ingredients. And believe it or not, uh, we're still looking for the active ingredients. I have a chemist who, who is actually trying to isolate, try to fraction, fraction the stevia, uh, stevia liquid and see if we can find the fraction which is more effective than the whole stevia leaf. Might not be. Again, when you're working with alternative uh, products, sometimes it's, again, it's a very important synergetic effect from different compounds in the same product. So we will see, we will see. Yeah. D dosage is being asked about as well, but I suspect that depends very much on the actual product that you buy Absolutely. and how concentrated it is. Absolutely. Also, questions are coming in asking whether herbs could be used instead of taking antibiotics when one has both Lyme and breast cancer. I refer you to another other study we back, did back in 2012 ish, 13. Um, uh, when we looked at the cardon herbs, I'm sure you heard about the cardon herbs, and we some entobenderol uh, and some other cardon herbs. And again, um, we found a very, very interesting effect uh, comparing, if you look at the paper, we did compare it uh, to a strong anti uh, antibody combination. Again, that was in a test tube. See, this, this is the problem. You, you want to study so many different antimicrobials. You want to study a combination. You need, uh, you can do it in a test tube relatively, you know, inexpensively. But when it comes to, you know, an actual animal, you need something which you can afford. So that's why the zebrafish model, I still believe, would be very, very important for us. Thank you. Um, a few questions came in beforehand, and I'll just go through those now. Um, do you think Borrelia could be related to triple negative breast cancer or the hormonal related cancers or possibly both? I think you did mention triple negative, in fact, yes, in the presentation. Yeah. So uh, right now we're focusing a little bit on triple negative for obvious reasons. Triple negative breast cancer, really, we don't have any 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 good therapy right now. So, but at the same time in the lab, we have uh, all kinds of different cell lines, some of them uh, uh, ERPR, so hormones uh, are positive, some of them uh, different combination, different, different uh, depends on cell lines. So I mentioned a little bit, this data still needs to be confirmed to see exactly uh, where uh, Borrelia, uh, what Borrelia favors. It favors certain type of cells, um, Right now, uh, the only thing we know that, um, and I, I don't think it was in my presentation, but it is in the paper, that when we looked at how easily a body can infect a, a cancer cells and compared it to a normal epithelial cells, somehow Borrelia can, can infect cancer cells much more effect, effectively. It's very, very interesting. Thank you. And um, do you think um, that there are promising responses to immunotherapy drugs that are being seen, not just in those with PDL positive breast cancer, that means programmed death ligand? Um, this participant says she's heard that immunotherapy might have a place in treating long term symptoms of Lyme disease. Could you comment on that? Absolutely. Um, right now, this is exactly we try to see a little bit. Uh, Bet, uh, better understanding the host and pathogen interaction, exactly what happens there, what is exactly the immune, immune uh, uh, system role here. We know that uh, Borrelia can trick our immune system. Very, it doesn't matter if it's innate or adaptive. Um, I'm, I'm sure most of you heard about that, you know, uh, how uh, practically every single every single part of the immune system can be can be sort of switched around by Borrelia, but it's smart bacteria. So I think it's definitely a role for immune therapy, but I think we still have to understand a little bit better what exactly, especially if you look at breast cancer cells, breast cancer tissues, 
what exactly the immune system is, is doing on this, on, this, on this breast cancer tissue. Thank you. And a complex question here. Um, MYC-driven immune evasion in triple negative cancer, and MYC is a key regulator of proliferation. Um, a recent study talks about using doxycycline to switch oncoprotein CMYC on and off when removed. Is this significant for Lyme patients who are treated on repeat and sometimes long courses of doxycycline, do you think? Oh, it's a very interesting question. And uh, again, back to this 2022 April uh, cell paper, when they treated those, those uh, breast cancer tissues with doxycycline. Actually, if look, uh, go and look at those paper. Uh, um, in one of the figure, actually looks like doxycycline, very, very, very effective to reducing the tumor size. So again, what exactly the mechanism? Obviously, this is this is gonna be uh, the center of the question, of the, especially after this paper. But it's super interesting that you know doxycycline can have this kind of effect. Thank you. Um, do you have any knowledge of whether oxygen in heavily oxygenated plasma, say under a hyperbaric therapy, can enter biofilms? Very good question. Uh, let me switch it around this question because I'm not a hyperbaric gym. I, I love that therapy, but I, I don't know that much about it. But um, back in this 2022 April paper, you can see how fascinated I am with this paper. They actually looked at um, em uh, low oxygen environment and high oxygen environment. Low oxygen environment was actually the breast, breast tumor tissue. But the, but the metastatic tissue was in the lung, which is obviously a higher oxygen environment. And they find different um, pathogens. It was super interesting. So back to the question, uh, we had one, um, one study, never published. There is a reason because game is a small university and, and sometimes you cannot afford certain equipment. But we did study uh, oxygen effect on Borrelia, especially in Borrelia biofilm. And the, and the bottom line was that the study is that even in a vacuum, now when I say vacuum, that is when the equipment broke. So it was still a very, very low amount of oxygen, but Borrelia biofilm grew beautifully. So Borrelia biofilm did not really, really uh, 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 mind the low oxygen environment. But when we, when we put the same biofilm in a high oxygen, environment actually was the growth was limited. So it's definitely something there. And, and the oxygen is extremely important for Borrelia as obviously uh, for other bacteria also. So back to therapy, I could see maybe that, you know, that uh, hyperbaric ch uh, chamber can help to, to address this issue. But again, that's a critical question. So Fantastic, sure. thank you. Um, relating to biofilm, because you've just mentioned it again, this is from um, Dr. Corby, another colleague of yours I know. Is the fish Borrelia test an option for checking on biofilms and breast cancer tissue? This measures Borrelia activity in the macrophages. Potential, potentially, um, I, I, I have to look into it. Uh, right now, that's exactly what we're doing. Right now, we try to find different uh, methods to not just to measure biofilm, but to see whether it is active or it is not just some dead leftover tissue, which some, some you know, colleagues of ours claim. Thank you. Um, earlier, you mentioned some herbs, and here one colleague is asking, was that garden herbs you mentioned? I think it was cowden herbs, wasn't it? Cowden. Dr. Cowden. Dr. Lee Cowden. Dr. The Dr. Lee Cowden, yeah. He's, he developed the... I mean, this is one of the, 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 the herbal protocol. I'm, uh, there are other very, very powerful protocols. Uh, the reason we, we, uh, we, um, we started with that one because it was, it was like a whole line of herbs. So we were, had a chance to really test a lot of different compounds in, 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 in one experiment. Uh, again, I was very impressed with the activity of those herbal compounds. Many of them are from the Amazon, aren't they? Yeah, correct. Um, correct. Can disulfuram therapy work on Borrelia with biofilms around it? Do you know? Um, 
we did some experiment, very limited. This is a problem sometimes working with, uh, with, with uh, students. I love them, uh, you know, but sometimes they have other priorities. So actually we started some experiment. It showed some, some promising results, but we unfortunately never really finished it. And after it was another project. So I don't have an answer, I'm sorry, at least from my lab. Okay, thank you. And perhaps one last question, because it is now also, uh, it's now after the hour. Um, do you have any thoughts on whether Epstein-Barr virus can interact with or even be associated with breast cancer? Um, absolutely. I'm pretty sure that, that that's the case. Uh, is I find it obviously very interesting that, you know, Epstein-Barr is, it is reactivated after, after uh, uh, borrelia infection. So, so what is the connection to breast cancer? Obviously, we need to study it a little bit further, but, but definitely a very, very good question. Okay, thank you. Well, will you, sorry, a last question from me now that bundles several other questions here, which is, uh, will you be um, continuing to study the effects primarily of antibiotics on breast cancer and Borrelia or also of herbs? Very good question, Julian. Actually, uh, I have a student who is setting up a thesis project exactly answering this question. That's brilliant. Well, I hope it'll be all right if we ask you back again. Thank you. Uh, of I, either when you have those results or even before, because we have uh, lots of other questions as well. So many, many um, accolades here, you know, people who have found your presentation really amazing very very interesting indeed excellent thank you very much um, just to mention that um, Dr. Schwarzbach will be presenting a uh, presentation on the 28th of July at seven o'clock that's a Thursday on the growing evidence between infections and cancer and uh, Professor Sharpie if you have time to be present on that one as well and to Absolutely. make any comments, ask any questions, that would be just tremendous. Absolutely. That's, that's in just over two weeks time. So many, many thanks again. And thank you everybody who was here. Um, thank you for, so much for taking the time and um, the very, thank very you. best for the continuing research. Thank, thank you. you, Julia, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Mm -hmm. Bye.